Good morning. Welcome to Ebenezer United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, we are glad you are here with us this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's join together with Leah as she leads us in the call to worship. Come with your gifts and your needs to take a place in beloved community. Come with your accomplishments and your failures. Real with each other and to learn interdependence. Come with your plans and your questions. Empowered by Jesus to let go, to make space, to see God's kingdom here. And now if we could join together to sing here in this place. Holy One, may your presence here open our minds. May your spirit among us help us to find you are rising up now like a fountain of grace from the whole. join me in praying together. Good teacher, remind us today that all things are possible with you. Remind us that we never have to do anything to earn your love. Remind us that the last are not least and that giving our love away will bring it back a hundredfold. Thank you for the promise of eternal life and the possibility to inherit treasure in heaven. Until then, we will treasure you and your steadfast love for us here on earth. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Today's scripture is from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard will it be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? 
Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news. Who will not receive hundredfold now? In, in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. And now I would like to turn it over to Dar and a time especially for children. So do you follow the rules every single, every one of the rules that you're told you have to follow? Every single one? Like to not tell a fib or a lie? I don't even manage to follow all the rules. How about you guys? You follow all the rules? No. No. Well, it kind of is something that seems pretty impossible, doesn't it? word for our sound system, so we don't want to play with that. Well, there was a man back in the Bible times that the Bible tells us this story that came up to Jesus and said, you know, I want to know how to get to heaven. And Jesus said, well, follow all the rules. And he said, well, I follow all the rules. I've done that. I've always followed all the rules. And then Jesus said, because this guy was really rich, he said to him, well, then you need to give up everything that's important to you, all of those possessions you have, all your money, and then follow me. Boy, when you've got a lot of stuff, it's hard to give it up. Would you want to give up all your toys? No, that'd be pretty hard to do, right? Even if you followed every rule, but then if someone came to you and said, well, now you've got to give up your stuff. I know that would be hard for me to do. And trust me, I've got a lot of stuff. Well, what Jesus was trying to get him to see is, you know, it's impossible to do it on your own. And today I want you to think about, well, do you think it would be possible for you without a ladder, you have nothing to climb, could you reach the ceiling? Because that's pretty far up there, right? That's way up there. Nope, can't do that. Um, how about, can you touch your elbow to your ear? No, nah, it doesn't quite make it, does it? No, no, no. This one my daughter will really think is funny. And hopefully the camera's on you and not me. <laughs> Can you touch your nose with your tongue? Some people can. <laughs> well, lots of things are impossible, right? Now, in the story, Jesus goes on to say, I think I may be, that's not a good thing. I think it fell into my pincushion too far. I, I had a needle here a little while ago in my pincushion. Um, do we have anybody who's at least six feet tall that'd be willing to come up and help me show an object lesson? Somebody who's six feet tall. Oh, come on, you don't have to say a word. <laughs> Nobody. Tina, come on up. Five and a half is good. It's better than what? Yep, yep. Well, and I do you guys know what a sewing needle looks like and how teeny tiny the eye is? Like I said, I had one in here, and I think it got pushed into the thing too far. Itty bitty tiny sewing needle head. Do you think we could fit her through that? No. No. <laughs> well, in the, in the story, Jesus said, it's harder for a rich person to get to heaven than to put a camel, and a camel is about as tall as Tina, or a little taller, through the a little, itty bitty tiny hot eye of a needle. It, oh, it's even, yep, itty bitty tiny, tiny, tiny. We couldn't do it, right? Thank you, Tina, that's all we needed. Yeah, well, even if it's that big, we still couldn't fit a camel through there, right? But you know what, what Jesus is, not quite, what Jesus wants us to know is, we don't 
don't have to worry about trying to earn our place with God. That's a gift. And you can't earn gifts, right? Gifts are something that are given to you because somebody loves you a whole lot. And God loves you so, so much that God gives you that gift. Can you join me? I'm going to say a little prayer with you. Can you repeat it after me? You think? Dear God, thank you so much for loving us and giving us the gift of, of life forever. We thank you and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Awesome. You can go back to the table back there, and I know they've got snacks back there. And at this time, if you would rise and join together in singing ground and source of all that is. Ground and source of all that is One that anchors all our roots Being of all ways and forms Deepest home and final truth We live and move in you We live and move in you seated. When Lori asked Dar and I to take over the service, we agreed to kind of split it up. Dar got the service and I got the message. That was before I realized what a tough message this was. <laughs> um, really hard message we got today, but I'll give you my best. When I was growing up here at Ebenezer, I heard many sermons by Reverend Reuben Grotius. 
He regularly started his message by telling us three points he was going to make and then ended his message by repeating these points. That made taking sermon notes for confirmation class pretty easy. My three points today are, first, we don't know and can't know just what eternal life is, is like. Second, our values, our souls, our beliefs impact our eternal life. And third, God deserves, desires us to live in community with each other, to love our neighbor. Our scripture today is about a rich man and his request about eternal life. Researching this, I came across a fictional story that I found relevant to the scripture. There are many versions of this story, but this one I'm going to use is by author Anne E. Thompson. And here it is. Once upon a time, there was a man. He was a, a very rich man. He was also a very holy man. He trusted God with his life and tried his best to follow what he was taught. The man was now very old. As the man grew old and weak, he realized that soon he would die. He trusted that when that happened, he would go to heaven. But he was worried. He did not like the idea of going empty-handed, of not taking anything with him. God, he prayed, I know when I die, you have promised to accept me into heaven, and I know that I'm not meant to take anything, but please, could you make an exception in this case? Could you let me take a bag with me? Now, God is a kind God. So he considered the man's request very carefully. He knew that the man had tried his best to follow him during his life, that he had been generous and kind, that he had shown mercy and tried to live a good life. He knew that the man was very worried about this and God didn't want him to be anxious. So he agreed. He told the man he could take one small bag to heaven. Soon after this, as expected, the man died. He arrived in heaven carrying one small bag. Oh, said the angel at the entrance, you cannot bring that in here. You cannot bring anything to heaven. Yes, I know, replied the man, but God gave me special permission. So the angel went to check, and sure enough, he discovered that this man was allowed to bring one small bag into heaven. Now, word quickly spread among the angels and saints in heaven, and they all wondered, what had this man brought into heaven? So they all came, eager to see. They crowded around the man, peering over each other's shoulders, jostling for position as the man dealt down and slowly unzippered his bag. There, shining brightly, were four solid gold ball bars. There was a moment of complete silence. Then perplexed, one of the angels asked, you brought pavement? <laughs> Thompson continues, I love the story. I heard it in church. I cannot even remember who told it, but I've used it many times when teaching because I think it makes a good point. When we decide to follow God, we sometimes have to let go of things, and this can be hard. Whether it's our ambitions, dreams, or wealth, there is actually no point in holding on to them. What God provides is always so much better. We have our own thoughts and understanding of eternal life and heaven. The Bible has literally hundreds of references to heaven, eternal life, or the kingdom of God. Some view heaven as a place up there with roads paved of gold. The book of Revelation implies a heaven brought down here to earth. But as a quote I found about heaven from our Spill the Beans narrative lectionary materials says, 
The kingdom of God is something that none of us can comprehend with our limited imagination and perception. We just can't know. Our scripture today, the story of Jesus and the rich man, is also found in Matthew and Luke. Jesus' instructions to the rich man about what he needs to do to inherit eternal life seem harsh. Give everything away? Let's take a step back and look a little closer at this scripture and try to offer possible options as to what Jesus' instructions may mean for us today. Jesus was on a journey when the man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus first asked him why the man called Jesus good and said, no one is good but God alone. Before even answering the man's question, Jesus is challenging the question itself. No one but God is good enough to inherit eternal life and implying that entering the kingdom is not about being good in the first place. Jesus tells the man that he knows the man knows the commandments and enlisted the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. These are about how we are to treat each other. Interestingly, Jesus didn't list the commandments about how we are to treat God. Might there be a message here? Maybe that Jesus knew the man kept the commandments concerning his fellow human beings, but was unclear about his relationship with God. At any rate, the man replied, he kept all those commandments since his youth. Jesus then looked at him with love. In all the Gospel of Mark, this is the only place where it says Jesus loved someone. Jesus knew this man was sincere had led an honorable life, and yet was missing something. I think the man was missing a connection to the community. Jesus does not just tell the man to sell everything he owns, but also to give the proceeds to the poor. Jesus calls for more than a rich man just to get rid of his belongings, but he tells him to establish a relationship with the poor and to identify with them. When he understands this, the man went away grieving, for he had many possessions. We often assume that he did not sell his possessions, but the scripture really doesn't say that. Maybe he did sell his possessions and decide to follow Jesus. We don't know. Back to the scripture, though. Jesus then said to the disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. His disciples were perplexed by this, as are we. In Jesus' time, people believed wealth was seen as a sign of favor, of God's favor. Today, we have a large number of Christians who preach and follow the prosperity gospel, a materialistic view of God that claims, if you have enough faith, you will be wealthy, healthy, getting ready to experience the most wonderful blessings. Give enough money to your church and you will be blessed in this life. The prosperity gospel is a gospel that associates the rich with being blessed instead of the poor. This is totally inconsistent with our scripture. After repeating how hard it is for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God, Jesus gave the example of a camel going through the eye of a needle, an obvious impossibility. His disciples were astonished and concerned then if anyone could enter the kingdom of God. Jesus replied that for mortals it would be impossible, but for God all things are possible. We do not earn or buy our way in. Jesus then reassures his disciples that they who have left everything behind to join him will be rewarded in the age to come in eternal life. But many who are first will be last 
and the last will be first. Like the rich man in our story, Jesus like loves us. But like the rich man, Jesus wants us to change our relationship with the poor, to help them, to identify with them, and to participate in economic justice. Can we? Locally, we at Ebenezer have become involved in a limited way through preparing and serving meals at the warming center and community meals. We have some pastor designated funds for emergency use. Our laundry love ministry and our refugee activities represent economic justice activities. But we are not going to solve the problem of the poor by ourselves. After our recent book study of Speak with the Earth, our group discussed other possible books. Reverend Maleff suggested Poverty by Matthew Desmond. Desmond also wrote Evicted, a book about homelessness and rentals in Milwaukee. And we did a book study on Evicted a couple years ago. I have been reading Poverty. Desmond describes the many customs, laws, and practices that lead to poverty in the US today. Among these are a low minimum wage that has not been increased in decades, putting in prison many, especially black men, for nonviolent crimes, zoning restrictions for low-income housing, anti-union regulations and practices, excessive bank fees, inconsistent and confusing welfare programs, lack of public housing, and others. There are various ways to help the poor by changing some of our laws and regulations. We need to let our political leaders know that we are supportive of laws and regulations that assist the poor. This is not the time or place for me to go into detail here. A book study on this book, Poverty, would be helpful. However, Desmond points out that we must ask ourselves and then ask our community organizations, our employers, our places of worship, our schools, our political parties, our courts, our towns, our families. What are we doing to eliminate poverty? Our UCC denomination has established the United Church of Christ economic justice movement. Its vision is a just, sustainable, and resilient economy dedicated to the common good and the creation of a beloved community where the work of every person is valued and everyone shares equitably in the abundance of God's creation. Its mission is to strengthen the movement for economic justice by proclaiming our vision, partnering with allies, and furthering the work of our churches and communities. We are a part of a community with a mission to alleviate poverty and assist the poor. When asked what to do to, eternal, to inherit eternal life, the rich man was told by Jesus that he lacked one thing, to go sell what he owned and give the money to the poor. Like a parable, this story resists a simple explanation and makes us uncomfortable. But I think it's clear that Jesus wants, of, wants us to be part of the solution of inequity, whether it is selling everything we own and giving the proceeds to the poor, or to push for laws and regulations that eliminate barriers for the poor, or to assist the poor directly. God wants us active. God loves all his people. God expects us to love each other. Let's remember our three points. First, we don't know and can't know just what eternal life is like. Second, our values, our souls, our beliefs impact our eternal life. And third, God desires us to live in community with each other, to love our neighbor. When we discussed this scripture this week in Bible study, Cheryl Dodds summarized it all very well in stating that God wishes us to leave a legacy of values instead of a legacy of valuables. 
Just keep that in mind. Amen. And at this time, we invite you to uh, be grateful and generous. For you, all things are possible, O God. And so we come with both praise and prayer. Your blessings abound. And even when we misidentify them, still you give us every good gift. We thank you for your grace that calls us again and again. Grace that saves and reconciles and invites and transforms. We thank you for your body of church, for this community in which we learn and grow, worship and serve, where we can be real and vulnerable, practicing sharing the love and grace you so freely give. In response for all we have received, we share our tithes and offerings. At Ebenezer United Church of Christ, there are those that like to share their offering through the Dropbox outside the church. Some prefer to do it electronically, online, on their phones, all those good things that Dar doesn't understand or want to understand. Um, some of you do it by the planned giving, the, through the, you know, you just let Ron take care of it behind the scenes. But there are also those that like to do that here during worship. And we do have offering plates at both of the doors, um, to the um, entrance doors to the sanctuary for those that have their offering with them today. At this time, let's join our voices together, standing if, as you can, um, to sing Richard Bruck Bruxford Culligan's song, To Be Faithful. Join me in the prayer of dedication in the Lord's Prayer. Bless these gifts, we pray, to be instruments through which your beloved community can be made known. For this we pray, as Jesus taught us to pray together when he said, Loving God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. 
And at this time, we turn our attention to uh, focusing on our life together. If there's anyone that has a, uh, an announcement, if you'd kind of come around, that would be wonderful so that you can share those. Um, and as we have Julie approaching the front, uh, just a reminder that this Wednesday, we begin our Lent lunches. Um, rather than having evening services, we're trying something new this year. So this week, we will be gathering in the chapel. Um, if you would like to be able to, to attend, you can just show up, but otherwise it's helpful. If you sign up, there is a sign-up sheet for the next five weeks, actually, on the comma counter. Um, it's, a, it's a potluck type of a meal. If you can share something, great, but if you can't, you are still more than welcome. So we'd love to have you there for that. Julie. So um, if you haven't had an opportunity to look at the volunteer information sheet that was posted in the Ebenezer update, uh, there's plenty of copies on the counter that you can take along because it's jam-packed with a lot of information about this very, very busy month coming up in March. The first thing with the rummage sale, of our online event has started. We were blessed with some downsizing houses, so we had stuff that we're posting online. If you have anything to go into the online sale, we want to talk with you sooner than later um, because we started last week. And Lisa, I think you posted like 200 items already, so we're doing we're doing well. And the monies that we are raising this year for the mission trip is going to be for a local mission trip. So. We're not traveling, and Reverend Lori is putting together those details, and we'll roll that out um, as they are put together. So that's pretty exciting. We're using our valuables to help other people um, who are in need right here in our local community. Along with the um, online sale, we'll roll into the drop-off sessions. We'll start March 7th, and that schedule is on that sheet as well. So that's when the big loads come in. Um, and uh, our ladies and gentlemen are very busy. We have 25, um, we call them RRRs, Ravishing Rummage Rebels. They have a lot of fun sorting and pricing, displaying, and if you want to be a part of that, uh, Deb Cook is here today. Um, she'll sign you up and get you on that list as well. So lots of volunteers are needed in the rummage area um, to help that be a huge success. Along with uh, the rummage sale, we also do egg rolls. So before rummage sale starts, we are making, I'm not sure if we're gonna hit 10,000. That was our goal the last two times, and we were really short. We don't have to meet that goal. We just wanna keep, keep on trying to make people happy with Ebenezer egg rolls. That's our goal more than anything, and the money is just a plus. The um, help that's needed, um, just to give you an idea of numbers and to also share appreciation to everybody who's involved, um, there's 25 RRRs and growing um, every year. And on the egg roll list, I know I have emails for 75 people. So, and that, does, that doesn't even include the people we don't have emails for. There's a lot of people. And we just want to, as leaders, say thank you for all your efforts that you do in helping um, these fundraisers be a success. Um, Sue Adamovich is here as well in back. She is heading up the suite sale so if you want to help her out by baking and um, helping man the, that corner of the event that would be much appreciated as well and i'm missing one of the other things oh sunshine stitchers we always have a little craft corner because the sunshine stitchers are a self-sustaining group so we make things um, to sell so that we have money to buy thread to make things that we give away so it's uh, a revolution of those events so again, this uh, is just a little summary of uh, what's going on, but the sheet is quite jam-packed. So please see any of the uh, people that I've mentioned if you want to tune into any of these projects. The last thing is I want to make an announcement for Dar and for Kim. Fellowship Hall is a wonderful organization of stuff, again, that we are turning into fidget mats, placemats, and um, mats for the homeless people that are sleeping outside. So if you'd like to tune into that project, we are here today from 11 to 4, and tomorrow 11 to 4, and on Tuesday, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. And then we'll be cleaning up the hall and working on the next event. So hope you can plug in. Thank you. And also thank you to Julie for 
keeping it all together so that <laughs> we know what we're doing. <laughs> Where would we be without Julie? I know she doesn't like to be lifted up, but I'm up here, so I'm going to do it. Um, another reminder, another fundraiser coming up is the youth will have their brat fry on March 3rd. They'll be serving from 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock. And for those of you that like making those sweet treats, I know Sue needs them for, um, for the rummage sale, but the kids also could use some sweet treats for their, their brat fry on the 3rd. And I did also notice in the update, it is time to order those Easter flowers. So check your update for that form and get those in. They, the orders are due by March 3rd. So March 3rd seems to be a big date. All right. So at this time, if you would, are, are there any other announcements, first of all, before I move on? Then at this time, we will close with our sending song. If you would please rise as you can and um, lift your voices to sing Yezu, Yezu, fill us with your love. Number 498 in the New Century Hymnal. I send you out today to work on building that legacy of values instead of valuables. Being God within humankind, showing the world what we really know is important, not those things, not how can we get to heaven on our own, but knowing that all things are due to God's mercy. And at this time, I would ask you to reach out to your neighbor, however you're comfortable, joining hands, joining elbows, whatever you're comfortable with, to, to join together in the Alleluia benediction.
love of God our Creator, and the grace of Jesus Christ our Savior, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen.